is there is there a sports podcast in Detroit that people are talking about? Hey everybody, this is Freddie Cohn of ESPN Radio. When I'm not talking about breaking news or breaking news on ESPN Radio, I'm always a fan and listen to the Detroit Sports Podcast, and so should you. This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Episode 205 is going to be lit. I guarantee it. Welcome to another episode of Doc and Jock. Joining me, my cousin Adam Strozinski. I am the Doc, John Macaroon. Impromptu debate we're going to have right now. I got a feeling this might pop off right here, right now. In You're episode so 205. on fleek already. I'm on fleek. <laughs> I'm ready to go. What does that even mean? Bro, how can you not be a fan of Floyd Money Mayweather? I You're sitting him. here telling I me hate you hate him. him. Totally wrong. I hate him. Why do you hate him? I hate him. I can't stand him. I just do. I feel okay. So if you were to take every like all your worst qualities, all of your worst qualities, right? You take your arrogance. You take your cocksuredness for not doing a whole lot. You're uh, a dick. You, you take you take everything that is bad about you, right? And, and believe me, I love you. I say this. This comes from a very loving place. But if you take everything that is horrible about you, right? All the disdain I have for these certain characteristics that you have, and then multiply them by fifteen, you still can't reach. Floyd Money Mayweather's level. You just can't. You absolutely can't. Wait, and here's the thing. You're an MMA fan. You're like the biggest MMA guy I know. What are you talking about? Yeah, I figured for sure you would be on the Condor train. I'm a fan of, you know, great shows, great performances. Both of them, I give them credit. You know, McGregor, to be able to make that much money crossing over to a different sport, you got to give him all props. And if he actually does shock the world and win, he'll be the highest paid athlete in the next couple years with all the appearances he's going to make. And the reason why I have respect for Floyd Money Mayweather is the fact that he's been able to craft a career basically being a defensive fighter despite the fact that nobody likes the way he fights. And, you know, back in the day, everybody would love boxing. You know, we've had a couple boxers. It's an awful show, too. It's so bad to watch his fights. Exactly. And so back in the day, you know, all the old fighters would say, look, we'd, we'd get into the first round. If you want to YouTube Hagler Hearns, boom, they would throw down in the first three mm-hmm. seconds. They're punching. But Floyd Money Mayweather, he looked at the landscape and said, look, I want to have a long-ass career. And how do you draw $75 million per fight or more if you don't take hits? So, in essence, you just said it. His fights are boring, mm-hmm. stale. Nobody really would say they're great, but people buy it. Yeah, this is what I, was, this is what I don't get. Why people buy them. Here's the thing. I got, I got all aboard for the Pacquiao-Mayweather fight, and, and I, I chipped in on that, and I watched it with a couple of buddies. I, I remember live-tweeting that fight, and it was an awful fight. It was absolutely boring. It was brutal to watch. I was upset that I paid the money to sit there and watch the damn thing. And this is what I don't get. How he's able to draw so much money... And his fights are so damn boring. There's nothing fun to watch about his fights. I enjoy Manny Pacquiao. I think Manny Pacquiao's fights are great. I remember watching Manny Pacquiao and um, uh, Ricky Hatton. And, and I loved that fight. I thought that fight was outstanding. I was popping hard, and I was a huge fan of Ricky Hatton. I thought it was great. I thought it was a really good fight. And then you turn around and you watch a Floyd Mayweather fight, and you're just like, what the hell is going on here? I paid a hundred and some dollars to watch this? See, that's the problem is that when, when you got to pay upwards of $100 to watch a fight, no, see, what you do is you got to get 10 guys to chip in 10 bucks and go to one place. You can't chip in that much money. You got to get in at a low price and try to get it at, to watch it as, as cheaply as possible. Well, but these, this isn't too bad. This fight's going to be about $100 yeah, for a high bad. def. So that's, I guess, all things considered, what they could have charged for this fight, mm-hmm. that's not too bad. But many people who are in the know in boxing and those that comment on Floyd Money Mayweather say, look, that's a style that's almost impossible to repeat. And the fact that he's a super fast defensive fighter and there is a level of skill in boxing outside of the technical force that it takes to punch someone in the face and knock him out. The fact of the matter is Floyd Money Mayweather is like the Hulk Hogan of wrestling in that he's got a big personality and many people will say when they comment on Hogan, oh, dude didn't have a great work rate. Dude was just an entertainer. But look, if you can avoid bumping 
and taking huge falls like Mick Foley. Would you, if you balance it out, would you rather be Mick Foley now, where you got to get four or five hip replacements, two, three knee replacements, walking around like two miles an hour? Or would you rather be Hulk Hogan right now, who's touring the world, having sex with beautiful women, living life, and being able to live his life? Well, here's I the would deal. choose the, the Hulk Hogan side. I would totally choose Hulk Hogan, and I would be the racist that he is. Because I sat there, sued Gawker, and now I'm a bajillionaire. Exactly. And I can just ride off into the sunset, and I don't even got to mess around with anything. Exactly. So I would totally choose Hogan. I get what you're saying. So Floyd Money Mayweather is a genius, a marketing genius. Listen, all he this does is hype. himself well. It's all hype. You know it. I mean, when you really look at it, he's done a bunch of 24-7s where you get a chance to see his relationship with his kids. Now, there's definitely off the, you know, stuff. there's stuff going on in his personal life. Oh, like anger smacking management. his girlfriends it, around? Exactly. Or his wives? But, uh, you know, in essence. Or his baby mamas? But professionally speaking, not in terms of his personal life and all that, professionally speaking, the man can box, and he's perfected the art of defensive boxing to the point where, you know, he's taken a couple of years off, can still come back and draw $100 million. But the question is, though, many people are starting to kind of nitpick is, d- did he bastardize the sport for basically taking money to fight a guy that's not even a boxer? And we had a boxer in here um, talking about the fact that, by rule, a champion is not supposed to fight anybody outside of the top 10 by boxing standards. So why does Conor McGregor get to jump in front of all the number one contenders? There's no two, title on the three. line. Floyd Mayweather, I think, is a champion. I don't know if the title's yeah, not on the line. But there's no title on the line. Right, so but th- this, is, this is like an exhibition. But do you get upset that Floyd Money Mayweather potentially is taking this fight just for the cash? Did he bastardize No, because the sport? That's, that's how he's fought. That's, that's, what the, that's what his MO has been for his last 15 fights, and probably more than that. I mean, this is what the guy is. I mean, he's a money-hungry, grubbing son of a SOB. You know what I'm saying? It's just what he is. This is the thing. You can look at Floyd Money Mayweather and look at his in-ring work, and you could say, yeah, he revolutionized the sport. He's done something that probably won't be able to be repeated with his style, and his record probably will, won't ever be able to be touched because he's undefeated. You know, and I don't expect him to be. I don't expect him to lose to Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor is stepping into a realm that he's not necessarily used to. I know that you can sit there and you can box a little bit in MMA, but it's totally different. You know, that sport is completely different than what he's about to sit there and encounter. And I know he's going through all the training, and I understand that he boxed before he got into MMA. This, that, and the other thing. If he was a really good boxer, why he wouldn't be in MMA right now. So there's a reason why he's doing MMA. It's because he wasn't a good boxer. He is. He sets all these things up for the money. And and personally, he's a he's a he's a piece of POS man. He, honestly, I'm, I'm trying not to swear here. He is a piece of trash. You know what I'm saying? Uh, hey, look, he's got money that he owes to the IRS. He's got money that he owes to baby mamas. And the guy sits there, and all he does is he flaunt, flaunts how much money he has. So wouldn't like, someone say what that? What are you doing? Take care of your business, bro. Wouldn't someone say that you're being a hypocrite then? If you're going to chip in and pay 100 bucks to watch him, you're, you're contributing to the pie that he's going to collect and flaunt at the next fight if he has one. Don't watch him then. Why are you going to watch? Why are you going to get together with the boys and watch? You, you can say you can say that, but I I am also I would also be chipping in for for Conor McGregor, and I have no problem backing that man with the hope that Conor can uh, knock I, him I, out. I so I do. I hope Conor comes through on. His I think promise. you're wrong. I think Conor said he's going to knock him out in in four rounds. I hope so. I think it's going to go all twelve, and it's going to go to the judges. It It'll will. be a good fight. In the first couple rounds, you know Floyd's going to duck, and you know what's going to happen. Basically, what everyone's going to watch is. If Conor McGregor can hit Floyd, what's going to happen? And Floyd's going to duck, jab, and try his best to outbox Conor McGregor. And I think, based upon what everybody's been telling me, I mean, Thomas Hitman Hearns told us, everybody that's a boxing fan has said, look, this is going to be an outmatched situation. It's not even going to be that entertaining. But uh, Dana White's... It's a spectacle, though. Yep, Dana White's making the rounds, and he said, look, when two people fight... If Conor McGregor tags Floyd, there's a chance he goes down. He's, he's been out of the ring for two years. He's 41. Your jaw's not like it used to be. There's an opportunity. So that's what people are going to see. So if you have an opportunity to see it for like 15 bucks or less, I think it's worth it to see it. But I, I have great respect for Floyd Money Mayweather in, the, in that, you know, he's cashing checks for $100 million. He's revolutionized the sport of boxing. And he is the draw right now in terms of when you want to get your name over, you call out Floyd Mayweather, you get in the ring with him. Basically, he is the sport right now in terms of marketing, in terms of, you know, look at right now. Conor McGregor and him are doing a world tour. They're going to go all around. I know, it's so weird. It is weird. They're going to go around. Four city tour for a press conference. But but what's going to happen is, you know, look what he did at the first stop. And then Los Angeles pulls out a check for $100 million. And if you follow him on Twitter or on Instagram or other various social media outlets, 
dude can gamble and he puts up his tickets and what he gambles on and things like that. So he's a, he flaunts his wealth and many people are turned off by it. But for me, I think it's a little bit appealing and I, I have great respect for him. So I, I think you're a little bit wrong in terms of, you know, really falling into the hype of what he puts out there. And I can understand it, but that's not Floyd Mayweather. That's his, you know, basically wrestling persona is the money team. That's his persona. And basically he's the biggest heel and you're against it. But I, I respect the fact that you're getting a re- you're you're reacting to it. I think that he draws a reaction, good or bad. See, he's I, a heel. I think I think you're wrong. I think you're you're trying to differentiate what he is in the ring and what he That's is not in him. real life. That's not him. Dude, in real life, he's a piece of shit. We we've already covered this. He smacks his girlfriends around, right? He's kind of a dick to his kids. Him and his old man didn't even like him. It took forever for his old man to come back and have to deal with his ass. On top of all that, he just runs his mouth nonstop about a whole bunch of BS. The guy is a piece of trash. Like, if he was here, I'd tell him to his face. And then he could try to sit there and hit me as he's backing up, because that's how he fights. <laughs> Honestly. And, and look, this, the way this fight's going to go down, if Conor McGregor, and we could probably talk about this as this fight gets closer, if Conor McGregor can Tags sit him, there man. and not outpunch himself, not get punch drunk, where, where he's just sitting there swinging so hard he's winded and he, and he tires himself out in the first couple rounds, if he has a chance to where he can sit there and connect with, with Floyd's face... That's the draw. It, 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 it's probably going to be a short fight. Yeah. Because I don't know if Floyd... Like, look, I, I get it. He's, he's been in the ring with a ton of other guys who can hit really hard. But the way Connor swings, it, it's, it's absolutely nuts. I mean, there was a sports science on it. And this dude just crushes people's grills. Look, Floyd's a piece of trash in real life. I, I I I respect what he's done in the ring, and look, you don't become forty nine and zero by just taking shortcuts, right? You, you had to put the work in. You, you've done it. The guy stays in phenomenal shape. He stays in great shape. But I just I can't sit there and I can't pry the two away like you can. I think he's a piece of trash. That's just that's where I stand with it. No doubt about it. It's gonna be great to see this hype train is gonna keep moving all throughout the summer. August twenty sixth It's gonna be a great night. I think it uh, has the potential to be a huge night for either MMA or the boxing world, but the money that's going to be thrown around is outstanding. It's enormous, ginormous, and the hype, this is what boxing is really kind of come to right now. It's about hype, and it's about drawing viewers, and this fight will probably shatter all kinds of records. I'm going to watch it. You're going to watch well, it. And this is the thing. You know what sucks? I think I have a wedding that night. Oh! It. Oh, brother. I was out, I was making plans, and then I had to sit there and look on the refrigerator, and I was like, damn it. I this is bad. Yeah, it is, Adam. It's really bad. <laughs> Man. Okay, we'll see how this goes. Maybe there's be a way to kind of get out of this, weasel out of it. I don't know. You know, maybe I can get something on my phone. I don't know. It, it, I'm, I have to figure something out because I really want to see this fight. I'm hoping that the groom sits there and wheels a TV in and, and pays for the damn thing. <laughs> I hope so. I got to talk to him. I don't know. We'll see what happens. All right. We haven't talked a lot about college football. Some news was made in the last seven days, so we're definitely going to address some comments made by ESPN's Phil Steele, and then we're going to play a round of the Doctors in Session. And we'll finish this podcast off episode 205 live with the Doc and Jock Pro Wrestling Report. But before we get into, you know, Phil Steele and his comments regarding Michigan and Michigan State and who's on the hot seat, who's underrated, overrated, what stinks is, you know, Phil Steele was on this podcast. And when I saw some of the news that was made, I'm like, oh, okay, he's making the rounds. No, unbehance to me that. You know, Phil Steele's now with ESPN, and I'm like, okay, let's just go call him up. He's been on here before, and then I got the corporate email, and I'm mm-hmm. like, come on. I, you know, maybe you could help fill me in a little bit. I just don't understand the policy that an ESPN, you know, network would have in terms of when you sign a new talent, and I guess Phil Steele's now new or exclusive with ESPN. Fine. I all credit to Phil Steele. That's what you do. You hype yourself up. You do your publications in the hope that maybe a bigger company will sign you. But for a company like ESPN to then in every contract make them sign where Phil Steele can't go on a podcast like ours, he can only go on ESPN affiliates and ESPN affiliate websites. And the guy that's his handler was super cool and really nice, and he's always gotten back to me, unlike others who we email and they just ignore us. But I just find it so retarded and as a policy just to say that, look, now you have a certain segment of the population that follows us. And they don't get a chance to hear Phil Steele on our airwaves. And it's only 10 minutes talking about, hey, tell me what you think about some of those comments you made about Michigan. I think it's a bogus, absolutely retarded policy. And these guys got to sign it. And the way the handler made it seem like he's kind of like, well, we're still kind of going over the contract and re- and looking at it. It's kind of new to us. But he definitely was aware that Phil Steele he had to decline our invitation to come on this podcast. And he's been on before, and it's just a stupid policy. One that, if I was a talent, I'd say, no, take it out. I want to go on every show. I want to be able to go on wherever I want. Why are you going to restrict me? Because every single time, 
I go somewhere, I'm going to have them introduce me as ESPN's Phil Steele. It's a stupid policy. I, I don't get the theory behind it. I think it's stupid. Well, this is one of my concerns when we're sitting there putting the show together and we're talking about different things in, in our show prep meeting is we had reached out to Phil Still last year. I mean, less than 365 days ago, he was on this very podcast talking to us about previewing uh, college football, yeah, our college football teams. It was professional. Nothing bad. It we was. Yeah, it was outstanding. It was a really good conversation. Gave us a lot of good insight, especially into how he puts his magazine together. That's essentially the Bible for college football. And the moment that you end up working with ESPN, ESPN locks you into these ridiculous contracts where you can't do anything else with anybody else. It, that's why if you ever notice, when you watch ESPN, take a step back. What, when you watch them, notice that they only have their own analysts on. Exactly. It's only people who work with ESPN. That's it. They have nobody else. But uh, FS1, it's, CBS Sports Radio Network, they don't do that. I think it's a restrictive it's just, and stupid it, policy. It's the way ESPN works, and it's a way that they sit there and essentially they protect their guys. That way, they their guys aren't on other people's airs drawing ratings for them. That's how they become essentially a monster in, in the business. But if you look at it now, they're starting to lose a little bit of that foothold because they, they've invested so much money into these ridiculous TV contracts, the NBA being one of them. That's why the NBA is able to sit there and sign players to $244 million extensions. It's just retarded. Yeah, and uh, you know, as you know, I'm a fan of the Adam Carolla podcast, and he talked about it too. He was like, you know, when he started, you know, working in radio and, and, and doing his thing and, you know, building his name, reputation, he would go and he would really basically say, I would not turn down an interview. And he'd show up on the competition's radio station. And then the next day, he'd get called into a meeting and he thought he would get praised by the program director saying, good job, you know, they promoted your show on another network. He's like, Program directors are so stupid that he get you know reprimanded for going on another competition's network and talking about comedy and his life and stuff like that. And he'd be like, "Look how stupid program directors are." I sat in another network's chair and they were talking about your station, and you're going to come in here and chide me? Tell the program director to piss off because it's a stupid policy. Because in essence, if he goes anywhere, if Phil Steele goes to our podcast or any other thing, they're going to you know just say, "Introduce me as ESPN's." Phil Steele, plug my stuff through ESPN. How do you justify limiting press when someone's going to say your name, promote you? When we when we release the podcast to our followers, we're going to say ESPN's Phil Steele, and we'll acquiesce to any request. It's a stupid policy. That'd be in essence like me saying, Adam, you can only you know make phoners into Vito Show or the Jason and I Show. Mm -hmm. You can't go and talk to Ryan Schuling, or you can't go talk to Neil Rule on WDFN. That's ridiculous. That's exactly what and it is. Stupid. Mm -hmm. It's a stupid mindset. And, and and look at that, too. It's not universal because bigger towns like Linda Cohn, I can text her up right now and she'll be like, sure, because she hasn't maybe signed that part well, of the deal. That's what's weird, too, right? So I, I have, at this point, I have uh, Sirius XM for free for three months or whatever because I had to buy a new car. So I've been listening to a lot of Sirius, just taking it all in. And Linda Cohn, prime example, Linda Cohn was hosting on, on Mad Dog yeah. Radio the other day. It's just like... It's weird because they sit there and they allow certain people to do certain things. And I think a lot of what it is, and the reason for it, a major part of it anyways, is to sit there and protect the content, protect what is coming out. Let's just say Phil Steele decides to have a total breakdown, right? And scream on our airwaves. Well, yeah. yeah, he just, you know, we'll just he ends up sitting there just totally going AWOL. And we make news for us. Oh, right. It makes news for us. It puts him, it puts him, puts ESPN in a bad light. Now, if he does that on air, he just completely goes psycho on air. They can just dump it real quick. They don't even have to show it. It's locked away in a vault somewhere, and it says, do not ever watch, and nobody ever knows about it, right? I mean, what happens is it gets tweeted about, and we're like, oh, did Phil still really lose his shit on ESPN's uh, set before he went live? Is this really what happened? And then, you know, certain stories would end up coming out about it, but it's one of those things where there's no, there's no, no evidence, no proof. Do you know yeah, what I'm saying? It's yeah. a way to control the message. Yeah, That's all it is. And it just sucks because, you know, when you've, you've spoken to a guy and he's made news by what he said in the last week, you'd love to go right to the source. Yeah. And said you and I are just going to speculate about it, but we'll definitely speculate about it in the best way possible because I'm excited for what he said because first topic, I'm excited, is Phil Steele came out and he had his overrated, underrated list. And right there, smack dab, that made news and everybody was looking at it, Michigan overrated. And I was like... I totally agree with that. I didn't even have to read anything else. I can understand in that Michigan is in the top five. A lot of people are expecting that they're going to do great things. But, you know, they lost a ton of talent to the NFL. They're going to be maybe switching quarterbacks. They're going to maybe have an influx of new talent trying to learn a new system. And a guy like Phil Steele, who's very pragmatic, will say, hmm, 
it's not very often that a team that might roll out a new quarterback, a freshman quarterback, could have some great success, especially in a tough division where there's a national powerhouse like Ohio State. So I totally am in, in agreement with Phil Steele. Michigan overrated because game one is going to be telling in terms of what this Michigan team is going to be this year because they're going to go and they're going to play Florida and they're going to have to prove what they got right away. No cupcake. You got to play Florida and you got to go out there and you got to perform. Many people will hype up Michigan because of the hype train, because of the respect that they have for Jim Harbaugh. But when you're pragmatic about it and you're not a fan of Michigan, you can step back. You can say there are question marks because of the turnover, because of the fact that, you know, you might be rolling out a new quarterback. You got to see how it's going to look. And to just throw out blanket statements like, hey, Michigan's going to be in the top five is, in essence, showing the, all, the utmost respect for Jim Harbaugh. And it might be unfounded. Yeah, you know, I was a little bit put off when when I found out that Michigan sat there and was able to make it what were in certain rankings that are ranked in the top five. I thought that was a little bit uh, presumptuous and it didn't necessarily seem to make sense. And for a lot of the reason that Phil Steele goes on to give, citing there's a lot of turnover on the offensive and defensive line. Um, you've got a quarterback who in big games wasn't really able to prove it. You've got wide receivers on this team that are basically going to be brand new. Uh, I mean, if you look at last year... Y- Wilton Spate was bailed out by a all pro tight end, two wide receivers that had speed for days and could get down the field and basically beat any coverage that they were putting up against. Um, you didn't really have a good running game. That was, that was always in flux and always in question. Hopefully going into the season, they get that figured out, but you also had huge playmakers on defense. You had guys who could sit there and either get to the quarterback or could sit there, deflect the ball or force a turnover. And look, you don't have a Jordan Lewis. You don't have a Jabril Peppers. Uh, you don't have a Taco Charlton. You don't have these guys on this team going into this year right now because they're all in the NFL. The Michigan Wolverines lost 10 guys to the NFL last year. That's a lot of guys to replace. And I think Jim Harbaugh did a good job sitting there incorporating other talent last season to sit there and get them coached up. He knew what was going to happen. He knew that he had to sit there and he had to end up working guys in because he knew a lot of these guys weren't going to be here this season. But all that being said... That's a mighty tough road to hoe, especially with this schedule. Like you said, you got to sit there. You got to take on Florida. From there, you're taking on Cincinnati. Air Force is no cupcake. They run a really weird offense that can sit there and put up points. And then on top of that, you sit there, you fast forward through the season, and they've got to go on the road to Maryland, on the road to Wisconsin, and then they bring in Ohio State. And that's how you end your season. I mean, that that's brutal. And usually by the time you get to November – You've got guys who are injured, guys who are out, guys who can't even play anymore because uh, they're just too banged up. So yeah, I think they might be a little bit overrated. I think them being ranked five in the country right now, that's a little bit presumptuous. I have no, I have, make no bones about it. I, I think Michigan's going to have a solid effort this year. I think they're going to be a pretty good team. But I think going into the season, yeah, I think Phil Steele's right on. Michigan might be just a little bit overrated because you've got too many question marks on both sides of the ball. On top of that, you've got one of the toughest schedules in all of college football. So in looking at that roster, is there a player that you've targeted maybe that you say, okay, he can have a breakout year? Is it the quarterback? Is it one of the running backs? Is there a player that you feel has to take a massive step forward for Michigan to take the next step and maybe get out of the uh, notion of just being the the third best team in the division? Well, I think to start the season, a lot it's going to sit there and weigh heavy on Wilton Spade. He's got to come out, and he's got to be able to perform. He's got to take that next step to go forward. Is he the starter game one, you think? I, I think so. I, I don't know. I, I don't believe any of these other quarterbacks have, have really done enough to unseat him. On top of you got to realize, this is Wilton Spates now third season in this offense. He's probably the most well-versed at it. He's going to be the one who can sit there and, and really – you can open the playbook up, and you can do much more with him, whereas you've got these other guys that are coming in who are either – one maybe two one maybe two years in, in into the program, so they're just kind of learning it and they're just kind of you know feeling it all out and, and just kind of stretching their legs a little bit. But I think Wilton Spate's going to be the one that really and truly he, he, you're going to have to lean on him. He's going to be the guy who's going to have to take that next step, and he's going to really have to develop as a really good quarterback, and he's going to have to make really smart decisions. You, you, you're not going to have again a Jake Butt on this team and you're not going to have a Mar Darbo and you're not going to have a JU Cheston where you can just sit there and throw the ball up and let those guys make that play you know I mean there might be some guys on this team who can grow into that but at this point right now I don't know who they are I don't I don't think anybody can tell you that who those guys are so he's going to have to be really smart he's going to have to be real confident with the ball whether it, it it's placing it in the right spot 
whether it's making the right read or whether or not it's throwing it down the field and connecting with his receivers. I also think that you can sit there and you can expect a lot from a guy like Chris Evans. Chris Evans, this is what I was talking about when hopefully that running back situation gets figured out. In Flash's last season, Chris Evans was outstanding. He was a speedster. He he was elusive. He could sit there and and squirt through a hole between the tackles, and then he could turn something that looked like it was going to be nothing and turn that into a 5, 10, 15-yard gain. So the, 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 the rumor around the mill is he sat there, he's put on some muscle, he's filled out a little bit more, and if he can sit there and do that and not lose any of that speed, not lose any of that elusiveness, that's going to bode very well for Michigan. On top of it, this will now be his second year in the offense with the program, so he knows a little bit more of what to expect, and I, can, I think you can expect him to possibly be that lead back. He could be that tailback who's going to be able to sit there and help you get up and down the field and you're not going to have to sit there and worry about these busted running plays that we've seen a lot of from Michigan from the last two seasons. Last year, Jake Butt won the Mackey Award as the nation's best tight end, and every year they do a watch list. And who's on it already this year? His replacement, Tyrone Wheatley Jr. And that's a name you want to kind of keep an eye on because he's going to be tapped and he's going to be utilized potentially in that offense because of the fact that, hey, tight ends are a safety valve. For a quarterback, let's just say you do go with a younger quarterback not named Wilton Spate, and you say, okay, now you got a guy that can be a safety valve, and he's already on the watch list as a name that potentially you got to watch out for as a guy that can contribute to this offense outside of the receivers and outside of running backs. So look out for Tyrone Wheatley Jr. I agree. There's got to be a lot of players that have to step up, but I agree that many people are giving Michigan respect because of the fact that they have Jim Harbaugh, and the fact is that he's setting up and I don't know if it's still, if it's been implemented yet, but basically a system where we don't really need to talk about the players. It's just Jim Harbaugh's there, he's got his system, and he's going to plug and play each piece on offense, defense. I still think it's a little bit early to you know classify it as a system just yet. He has to have a big win. He's got to go out there and prove and really get over the hump and beating Ohio State a little bit more, continuing to play well versus rival opponents. Shoot, I don't think fans, and I think you'll, you'll probably attest to this too, I don't think fans are really going to be cool with 10-3 and three every single year. They want now, with Jim Harbaugh, they want the mantle. They want the trophy. For those that are talented like Jim Harbaugh, comes great big expectations. And I think this is one of the years where he might have big expectations and he might fall flat on his face with a team like this. But I still do believe he'll have his supporters. But it's growing. The dissent is growing in that many people are starting to say, look, are we going to win the big games? Are we going to you know, ever get to the point where we can start competing with Ohio State? We have to, Michigan has to take that next step at some point, and maybe next season, not this one, will be the year where no matter what happens, Jim Harbaugh is going to be held with his feet to the fire regarding what's going on with that program because it's a national program. And when you are coming out in the preseason and you're ranked number five and you lost all that talent, there's a great amount of expectations on the Michigan side. And I'm, I'm going to be interested to see how they tackle all that pressure on their shoulders. It's going to be fun to watch them. You totally took the words out of my mouth. I don't think it's this year. I think it's next year where, where the seat starts to get much, much warmer. I expect them to sit there and challenge this year. And I think the fan base expects them to sit there and be in the playoff conversation, if not in the playoff hunt all season long. And I think if you don't meet those expectations, it's going to be very disappointing. And like I said, I think the heat gets turned up. Speaking of another name, uh, on MSU side now, L.J. Scott. L.J. Scott was named to the Maxwell Award watch list, which is basically given out to, it's not the Heisman, it's that second tier, it's the guys who are right behind the Heisman Trophy winner. So does L.J. Scott have to be the offensive leader on this MSU team going forward to have success? Because it's been a very tumultuous season, and you've got uh, basically a brand new quarterback who's going to be taking the taking the mantle here. You've got an offense that looks like it's in flux and it looks like it should possibly be changing. Not really sure what's going to happen this season. And on top of that, they've lost pieces too. So they now have to rebound. Is LJ Scott, does he have to be the captain of this offense? Him or Lewerke? Okay, it's very nice to talk about Michigan State football outside of all the nastiness and all the outside off the field nonsense and things like that. But you can't dismiss it. You know, what is going to be the impact of all the off the field drama, dismissing a talented wide receiver in Corley Jr., dismissing talented football players left and right? And it makes it really challenging in that some of your draft classes have been kind of shot down because of behavioral issues. And now many people are watching the program not to really see what's going on on the field. They're going to be watching to make sure that, hey, look, Mark D'Antonio, 
recruiting staff? Are you bringing in guys that are going to be character guys? Because if there are two, three, four more violations and more headlines regarding nonsense, it's going to be really tough for Mark D'Antonio to survive. You know, in terms of the offense, I really like the fact that uh, Lewerke kind of came on in his in his stints. Unfortunately, the season was cut short. But L.J. Scott is a very talented running back, you know, but I do believe Madre London is going to have an opportunity to do some things. The thing with Michigan State and what everybody that, that watches and everybody that kind of peeks into the program is saying is like, look, the offense is stale. The defense is, is, is established through Mark D'Antonio and the efforts that they've built through their program, but the play calls are basically very predictable. You know, you don't have really a lot of excitement in terms of the offense. Mark D'Antonio, after a 3-9 and nine season, many people would have said, look, shake it up. Why do you have co-directors of your offense and co-directors of your defense? And why is everybody that's your boy getting a job that maybe they're not even good enough to do? And as state fans, we're all skeptical because when you go 3-9, and nine, that's a lot of, you know, holes in your program, which would indicate that you got to make some changes. But D'Antonio didn't do it. And so it leads all fans to believe like, okay, it's going to be more of the same because you didn't really add that much more talent and you got the same coaches. It's going to be more of the same first down, second down run, you know, <laughs> try trying to pound it down, you know, pound the rock down the opponent's neck. But in football, if they decide to stop you, you're going to have to put the ball in the quarterback's arms and, and let it rip and we'll see what happens. But I, I'm always of the opinion that with a team like Michigan State, you got to look to the quarterback and the running back one and one A. So do you think Lewerke is the one who's going to come out of all the preseason training and he's going to be, for that very first game, he's going to be the number one guy? I think the hype is going to be when people see Messiah DeWeaver, they want mm-hmm. him to play because of the sexy value and the upside that they see. But I think the best quarterback and the one that we saw on the field, the one that in game action where he was doing some things was Lewerke. So I would expect game one is going to be Lewerke, but in, with Michigan State, I would not be shocked at all if Messiah gets in there and does some things. So Lewerke won... Uh, the Weaver, Weaver, number two, and then yeah. what, Damian Terry, number three? You got it. And then after that, kind of a crap shoot, eh? Yep. And so with Phil Steele, he also kind of made comments regarding Mark D'Antonio mm-hmm. and saying when he put his list out on who's on the hot seat. I'm glad you're bringing this up because I was I, this surprised. is where I wanted to go to. Yeah, I was kind of surprised that he put Mark D'Antonio on the hot seat because of the fact that, you know, yes, a 3-9 and nine season is devastating. Yes, all the off-the-field stuff is really ridiculous and an embarrassment to the program. But when it all shakes out, Mark D'Antonio, besides the amount of culpability that you would want to assign to him in terms, of, in terms of how much blame he gets for all this, he's run a pretty much an okay ship in terms of when he heard the news, he reported it right away. No cover-ups, no nonsense. He, will, he, he conducted himself appropriately when the news broke that some nefarious things were going on with his players. You then say, look what he's done with that football program, taking it from an irrelevant program to the heights of a Rose Bowl, to the heights of where we got to sit here and debate and laugh and speculate on could Michigan State compete on the same field with Alabama? Now, the answer is no, and it's probably going to always be that way. But if you had told me when we started this podcast that you know we were going to sit here and talk about Michigan State being in the Final Four right away, pretty quickly, winning ahead of a, Michigan. Winning a Rose Bowl. Winning even. a Rose Bowl, all the great big games, the great memories that we had. Obviously, the the amazing performance at the big house where Michigan State was losing late in the game and uh, trouble no, with you, the snap. You, you never led. Yeah, trouble so, with there, the there snap. There was no losing. You never led the game. Trouble with the snap, exactly. And so we have great memories to lean on. And, and then the I, Twitter trolling that followed. Dude, that was awesome. No, it was not. It was but, embarrassing. <laughs> but at the same time, you look at it. Not and, just for my program, but for me. <laughs> it was awesome. And then you look at it and you say, okay, he had a terrible year, three and nine. How much more can a program tolerate? I do feel there's going to be increasing pressure, but I don't really feel like Mark D'Antonio is going to be on the hot seat. See, I think the seat's going to be extremely warm, and that's for reasons that you've already stated. You had the entire problem this offseason. It was totally a mess. It was a very messy situation. And look, a lot of that wasn't Mark D'Antonio's fault, and everybody said that he did uh, the right thing by all the letters of the law. He sat there, he followed all the rules, he reported this to who had to be reported, and he did his due diligence, and he took care of everything that he had to take care of. The, the big issue that I think is going to happen and is going to fall on the shoulders of Mark D'Antonio are his inability and the ineffectiveness to sit there and make those changes, the stubbornness to make those changes to your coaching staff. 
I mean, we, we've talked about it. The offense is stale. The offense is predictable. They run the same exact plays that they've been running for the last four or five years, and they don't bother to change it up. And then now you got a, a guy like PJ Fleck coming into Minnesota. He's going to be out there doing some wild ass shit. All and people are going to be crazy like, stuff. it's going to be amazing to see. And you got to, you know, kind of keep up with the times. You got to run some five wide receiver sets. You got to speed it up a little bit. Uh, the, I know, I understand in, in, in the days of old that Smash Mouth football was where it took you. You, you can always incorporate that late in games and things like that when you want to wear out a, t- wear out a squad. But it's going to be interesting to see. If Michigan State tries to continue to do that versus younger teams and teams that are really fast and the, the SEC type teams that are going to be coming into the Big Ten because it's a copycat league. It's a copycat thing. When you see teams led by P.J. Fleck, SEC teams, and you see teams that are flying all over the place and doing some things on offense, it's going to be really hard to continue to just run the ball, run the ball three times an hour. you got to be a little bit more creative. And I agree with you in, in that I would say that if it's another three-win season, that would elevate it into the, you know, where we're talking about it every day, like, okay, mm-hmm. maybe we, we, we should have maybe reached out to P.J. Fleck or maybe you'd still try to because you heard it, I heard it. Many people were clamoring to say, look, maybe you need to kind of go through some back channels and reach out to P.J. Fleck and see – would he want to take over your program? Would he want to be a guy that would maybe be next in line? But he took another job, and, you know, there's always opportunities for others to come in and maybe take over the job for Mark D'Antonio if it continues to be a problem. But you still got to give him credit for what he's done. In college football, you got to remember, Michigan went through struggles. Teams like Texas have gone through struggles. Alabama, prior to Saban, they weren't lighting up the world. It's true. Teams, it ebbs and flows because you have recruiting classes, and it takes time to build up your classes, and there's only really two programs right now that are like plug and play, and you just say, okay, Alabama, put them in there. Maybe Clemson now, boom, put them in there. Other than that, everybody else, it's a rat race to try and get into the college football playoff. So I have a great amount of respect for Mark D'Antonio, but yeah, he's got a huge hill to climb, and whereas when he when we started, he was at the top of the mountain, balls out, king, king of the crown, everything. These last couple of years have put him way back down in the totem pole. He's back now as an intern popper trying to work his way back up the mountain to the top. Do you think Michigan State's going to sit there and, and, and rule the day that they didn't go out after a guy like a P.J. Fleck or possibly look to make a change with Mark D'Antonio? Do you think it's going to come back and bite him in the butt? See, I really believe that a guy like Mark D'Antonio, he's done it before. So the program is like, look, you know, it's an aberration. We went through some things. There were some holes. Maybe we got high in our britches. And when you pick a quarterback that doesn't do well to replace a great quarterback, then you have an issue. Okay. You got to remember, Cook was a great quarterback. I think he covered up a lot of the flaws with that offense. NFL caliber. And then you go and you go to O'Connor and he sucks. And unfortunately, when you have a dip that bad from an NFL caliber quarterback to a guy that you think could have been somebody to carry the torch, it goes to show you how important the quarterback play is. Mm -hmm. And when it's bad, it went bad quick. And unfortunately, that's what happened. But I do think that, you know, the names that are kind of, you know, next up in line have an opportunity to do some things. But if Lewerke stinks and Messiah DeWeaver shits the bed and he's not the next, you got to remember, Michigan State's had a plethora of great quarterbacks, three, four in a row that have been productive. If you get two or three in a row that are not productive, that leads to your job getting axed. What is that? Three three in a row that have made it to the to the NFL and have produced Brian Hoyer, Kirk Cousins and Connor Cook. If I had told you that the person that everyone's waiting to set the quarterback market is Kirk Cousins, you would have said, "Get the hell out yeah, of here!" I told you, go fly a kite. <laughs> exactly. It's really it's amazing what he's done in Washington, especially with that organization and how putrid they've been for years. But that's another story for a different day. So some some odds came out as well for uh, college football, and Michigan is ranked number two in the Big Ten, while Michigan State is ranked number seven with 25 to one odds while Michigan's holding four to one odds. Do you think that's fair or foul? I think it's fair. I think most people going into the season really believe it's Ohio state and Michigan. Mm -hmm. And so I think overall the odds are pretty much fair in terms of where they got Michigan and where they got Michigan state. Um, Ohio state's the class of the big 10. Many people will always look to them in terms of the fact that you got young talent. You got Urban Meyer, who many people believe is the head of the class in terms of coaching in the Big Ten. And with Michigan State, you know, it's basically a wait-and-see approach. And 
everybody's going to be watching to see how do they rebound after a tumultuous season. And their schedule is not easy either, but it's a little bit easier than Michigan's. And so I do believe that Michigan State, if you were to ask me who has a chance to outkick their coverage, I would say Michigan State. Yeah, I think so too. I, I think going into this season, because look, at, at this point, the only thing Michigan can do is really beat Ohio State, which is a must. They're going to have to sit there, take care of business against Michigan State. You've got to start winning these rivalry games. Also, I think if you can sit there, you can go and you can beat Florida and tackle Florida. I think at that point, it helps elevate you. But Michigan's basically right there knocking on the door. They just got to sit there and knock the bully off the mountain, and that's Ohio State. So they don't have as much room to go. Whereas Michigan State, look, going into the season, they're by these odds, they're ranked seventh in the Big Ten. So it wouldn't surprise me if they sat there and were able to climb up to five or four, you know, because look, Mark Antonio is a very good coach. He's a very good coach. He's got a pedigree uh, of getting this program, especially when it's at its lowest, back up the mountain and, and sitting there competing with the very best in this league. So I, it wouldn't surprise me at all if Michigan State w- was sitting there and they gave both Michigan and Ohio State a run for their money this year, as well as a team like a Wisconsin or a Penn State. It wouldn't blow my mind at all just because you've got a coach that's already in place. He's got his system, and we can sit there and we can beat up his system as much as we want, especially on the offensive side of the ball. But he knows what he's doing, and he knows what he has with the players that he has there right now, and he's going to put them in the best position to win. It's the other coaches that I think most of us question and most of us have a problem with. How excited are you, man? College football, NFL football, basically six to eight weeks away. I know many people are calling this the dead zone, but I'm super excited. It's coming, man. It's coming quick. We'll be talking about Michigan, Michigan State, the Lions rather quickly, man. It's coming. I was going to say, this is probably one of the first years in all the years that we've been doing this where this, like you said, the dead zone, the, that 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 Major League offseason or that Major I, League I, All-Star break. I know they call it that, but if you're a sports fan, there's stuff to talk about. There is. And, and like this, this seriously, this week was so easy to put show prep together. It was oh. just one of those things to just sit down and we just, and we're all That's done. It. Four minutes tops. Yeah, it, it was it was just plug it in. I mean, it basically show prep was done as fast as we could finish typing. <laughs> yeah. It was so simple. No, man, I was saying like when people say, oh, this is the dead zone, you're talking about Calvin and contracts. I'm like, yeah, that's what sports is. It's like when you go out, you don't say what time of the year it is. You say, hey, let's talk about sports. Let's talk about some of the players and who we want, who we don't want, sell, trade, who's at the top, who's where. There's always things to talk about in sports, and that's why we're crazy enough to do this is that even if it is slow – there's things to talk about in terms of the future, the past. You can debate things like, look, we didn't have Floyd Mayweather on the show sheet, but you said you hated him. And I said, oh, Jesus Christ, I, I, I think he's great. Boom, we talk about it. That's what sports talk is, and I really don't believe in the dead zone. Yeah, you know, Major League Baseball has a week off, but for Tigers fan, it's an amazing week off. It's refreshing not to have to look at the Detroit Tigers until Friday because of the ineptness of the first half of the season. It was great. Literally, I kind of have passively watched them now for the last two weeks. I feel great. I'm ready to dig back in and and see how, you know, 5,000 people look at Comerica Park on Friday (laughs) when they come back. You know what? I'm waiting for the trade deadline. I'm hoping Al Avila doesn't gonna, screw it's gonna it up. It's going to pop off. Yeah. It's going to pop off, man. I mean, I can't wait. Th- this team's going to look dramatically different uh, come August 1st and, and probably come, what is it? I think the second trade deadline is what's like August 20-something. Uh, so this team's going to look dramatically different by the end of the season. It, it's going gonna, it's gonna to blow your mind how different this team's going to look. I just hope that Al Avila doesn't screw it up. That's the fingers crossed and everything. Just please, 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 please. We're going to take our first time out. We'll come back. We'll play around to the doctors in session. Jock has a lot of questions lined up, and I'll be here ready to deliver. Stay with us. You're listening to the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. Doc and Jock here. We want to tell you about our host site, Podomatic.com. When Adam and I first started this project, we were looking for a place to host our recorded audio, and thank goodness we found Podomatic. They've been our host site since we started this project back in September of 2013. All of our 700 podcasts that we've recorded have gone to one place, Podomatic.com. Great customer service, user-friendly, reliable links, no problems getting to iTunes, getting out to the world. I mean, Adam and I are getting a couple times a week now great reviews telling us, thank you for doing it. I'm from Tampa. I'm from Arizona. We don't get a lot of Detroit sports coverage. Thank you. Keep it going. And we appreciate all the support for those that have been listening. And the reason why that everybody across the nation and worldwide can listen to Doc and Jock is because we have a great host site. So if you're starting a brand new podcast and you want to reach success, you got to have a great place to put your podcast. And Doc and Jock recommend podomatic.com.
Doc and Jock, episode 205 rolls along. Thank you for supporting. Thank you for finding it across the various platforms where you can find podcasts. My goodness, man, when I saw the sheet, and uh, I thought the rule was when we do these segments that the, the number and the limit of questions was three. And every time that you make a list, it's like five, six, seven questions. I always want to know what's going on inside that brain of yours, man. I know. And I'm like, yeah. And I never say no, but I'm like, God, man. You know, the best part is I've got like, I've got like <laughs> questions and then I've got questions for that question. Nice. So it, this is, this is going to just, I don't know. It's probably going to take like 20 minutes for this segment. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm sorry, you, dude. No, it's all good, man. This is what we call the doctors in session. I'm ready to tackle whatever the jock has to deliver. But to be the man, you got to beat the man. And I'm saying, woo, right here. I'm the man. Woo. Bring it, baby. What do you got? Do you realize that the NFL never ceases to amaze, nor does it have an offseason? Recently, Calvin Johnson was out in Italy for the Italian Super Bowl, and uh, he's made some some media coverage. I'm not sure if you're aware. So I'm going to read you some quotes, and uh, I I really want to get your thoughts on all of this. All right, so Calvin Johnson was asked by the Italian media if he ever thought about changing his team. His quote, I mean, I thought about it, Johnson said via the Detroit News, just like in basketball, you know, guys, they create these super teams, but it's not quite like that in football where I had the freedom to just go. I was stuck in my contract with Detroit, and they told me they would not release my contract, so I would have to come back to them. I didn't see the chance for them to win a Super Bowl at the time, and for the work I was putting in, it wasn't worth my time to keep on beating my head against the wall, and I'm not going anywhere. It's the definition of insanity, Johnson added, laughing. That's everyone's goal when they come to the league. It's to win a Super Bowl. Johnson said that the, that the that's his ultimate goal. I wanted to win it, and like I said, I just didn't see the opportunity with the Lions. He continued to go on and talk about how Marshawn Lynch is in a perfect situation out there in Oakland. He sat there, took some time off, was able to sit there, go play in Oakland now, and it, it just they, they have a legit shot to now win a Super Bowl, and that was something that I think he was longing for as well. So, go Lions! Yeah! <laughs> that's right, Jarvie. So <laughs> what are your thoughts on this, man? Listen, when, I, when the news broke, I mean, you and I talked about it, and we said the same thing. Obviously, when you retire early, when you have an opportunity to make a million-dollar check every single year, Obviously, football is a tough sport. It's a grind, but we all knew this. I'm not mad. I'm not offended because of the fact that you would never expect Calvin Johnson, Barry Sanders to come out and bash your employer because guess what happens when you bash your employer? Guess what happens if you're an NFL athlete and you want to take a stand and sit down for the for the national anthem? You might not get another job. So you look at it and you say, okay, Calvin Johnson now was asked the question, hey, do you want to come back? And what's going on with your situation with the Lions? It's a combination of him being pissed off that he had to give up money. And the fact of the matter is, playing for the Lions is never going to be easy because you're going to have weird losses. You got to battle the referees. You got to battle the definite curse that's going on with them. And so I'm not mad at all. It's, it's obvious that that's what happened. I mean, you're not going to bash your employer while you're playing. You didn't have a chance to leave. I mean, you could say he could yes, have signed he another did. contract. He could have, listen, if you're offered $100 million from your team and the other team offers you 80 you might bite the bullet and say, okay, you know what, I'm going to take the extra $20 million and try to deal with it. But after the fact, when you're away from it all and you get a chance to reflect, you say, you know what, I didn't get a chance to win. Playing for the Lions sucked. It's not news. It's nothing that nobody with a brain would real, would not think was the reason why he stepped away from his career, basically with a couple years left to go. No problem with Calvin Johnson. I think most fans agree with him. Here's the deal. All right, and th- this, is where, this is what bothers me about the entire thing. He sat there and he ended up signing like a seven-year extension with, I think it was like a year or two left on his contract. If he was that upset with everything, he didn't have to sign that extension. That was back in 2012. Money talks, he could, bro. He could have said that. Money talks. He, at that time, he was the best wide receiver in the league. He could have went anywhere and got a ton of money. Listen, if I flash enough green, you would sit here and do a five-hour show with me. I Well, I would do a five-hour <laughs> show with you regardless, just because so, I like to talk sports with you. Yeah. But here's the thing. He didn't have to stay here. If he was that unhappy, go someplace else. Leave. Just go. It's fine. And Dominic and Sue did it. You can do it, too. Matt Stafford might do it as well. You never know. I, I See, when you, when you debated it, though, 
part of that weighed into it. But the other part, too, was he had a relationship with Stafford. He's got a relationship with the boys. And so you don't want to feel like you're abandoning ship. And That's so- fine, but you got to do what's best for you. You talk about your goal is to win, right? Mm-hmm. Have you ever been on a team where you're like, there is no chance in hell we're ever going to win? Like, I've been on a couple of those. And it's just like, yeah, I'm really close with these guys. But if I was ever offered the opportunity to go someplace else, I even told those guys, like, dude, look, if this team came around <laughs> and asked me if I could go play for them, I would leave. I would go play because you know why? I want to win. It's all about winning. Yeah. At the same time, though, the agents, family, other influences will come to you and say, look, it's $100 million, $20 million more. Look, you know, it's going to set you up for the rest of your life. You want to have two, three, four, five, six kids. You'll have no problem with money for the rest of your life. Your next generation will be fine. The next, next generation will be fine. And so sometimes you put money ahead of winning. And when you reflect back on it, he probably is sitting going, you know what? when I'm 32 now and just kind of walking through Italy and thinking about winning and losing, it's now starting to catch up a little bit that maybe, you know, the whereas before it was like 60-40 to stay, it probably now is like 60-40. I probably should have left. I, I just want to fill you in a little bit here. So when he broke into the league, his first year, he made over $21 million, okay? By 2011, with no signing bonus, bonuses or all that, he was making over $11 million a season, okay? So right there, in just two seasons of football, that guy made over $32 million. So now you sit there and you move on to 2012 where he signs his contract, all right, when he signs that extension, and that guy's bringing in 21, over almost $22 million that season alone. That then jumps to $25 million the following season, and then he makes a, a paltry $5 million for 2014, and then in 2015, he's making $12.5 million. So I don't want to hear about the money. For this guy's career, he made over $113 million. You can kiss my ass, bro. I don't care. If, if it was that important to you to win, you should have left then. It, this, this, is, this is complete and utter BS. It, does this tarnish his legacy, all this bitching and complaining? Because... Ever since he's basically walked away and retired, he's done nothing but badmouth the Lions, talk about how awful this organization was, and, and believe me, the entire time he was here, he was sitting there telling guys how great it was and, and how much he's a fan of, of, of the Detroit Lions. It's funny because let's just say they want to have him back. How awkward is that going to be? You know what I'm saying? You guys sucked. And uh, you guys, you know, I like the word he felt stuck in his yeah. contract. And he used the word, the definition of insanity, beating my head against the wall. But that's what the Lions do to you is that you think you're going to win. You think you're going to have an opportunity to do some things. And what happens? You end up feeling like you beat your head against the wall. And that's just what happens. And anybody that leaves the Lions is going to start to tell you that. So that's, that's just what happens. All right, moving on. So the other day, me and you got into a little bit of a, a, a Twitter tiff there, and this was talking about Al Avila and, and, and the possibility of him trading Michael Fulmer. So I want to know what your reasons are for wanting to trade Michael Fulmer, and I want to know if you really feel in your heart of hearts this is going to help the Tigers and help set them up to be an actual World Series contender in the next four or five years. Didn't you find it funny that, you know, you and I were just shooting like this off the cuff, and I said, look, there's no untouchables. Trade Michael Fulmer three weeks ago. And I said, look, because and the reason why I said it, and it was cool that, you know, more people got on the bandwagon, but it, it popped off because the Cubs, it got out there that they've contacted the Tigers and said, hey, what do you think about potentially letting us have Michael Fulmer? Because they said, we're off the JV bandwagon. We don't want him anymore. We want Michael Fulmer. So everyone's now been debating it. And I didn't say you have to do it. I said that there's no untouchables. And the reason why you trade Michael Fulmer is when you lay out the landscape, right now I want a complete rebuild. Not because I want to sell everybody or I want a whole new team. The reason is, is you got an asset. And Michael Fulmer is an asset. Are the Tigers going to win in the next four years that you have control of him? I say no. And so when I look at it, I say, okay, Michael Fulmer is one player that pitches once every five days. If you can get a haul, if you can get a legitimate offer where you get the top prospect in an organization, and you get an everyday player, and you get a plethora of talent, and then that's that's your philosophy in terms of the trades you make, is Michael Fulmer nets you two guys. Then you go with J.D. Martinez, nets you two or three guys. Then you go with Justin Wilson, nets you two or three guys. Of course, not all of them are going to hit. Okay, but in essence, you hope that more than half of them hit in terms of your, you know, scouting and who you want. So if you get seven, eight players and four of them hit, instead of having two players, now you have four that can contribute. And remember, I'm not thinking about next year. Of course, trading Fulmer would be a disaster next year. You're looking at over 100 losses. But in terms of a complete rebuild, you can't rebuild light. 
how do you rebuild and try to trade away your garbage? And that was the essence of what I was saying to you is that, yes, we all say trade JV, trade Ian Kinsler, trade Iglesias, trade McCann. But those guys are going to net you basically a McCann plus or an Iglesias a little bit better, maybe. You know, you're not going to get great value. In order to improve your team, you need assets. You need to replenish the minor league system. Now, if Michael Fulmer's here, I'm going to love, look, look. If he's here on the team, I'm going to respect him and love him and cheer for him. His bobblehead's right over my shoulder. I took my nephew to go have his autographs. I'm going to cheer for him. But when you ask me what Michael Fulmer could get you, if it's a haul, if it's a legitimate offer that you would say, okay, it's it's a Chris Sale type thing where we get big, huge numbers back and we got a guy, we can maybe get two Michael Fulmer's back. The odds of that are low, yes, many people will say that, but it's not out of the realm of possibility to entertain the notion of trading Michael Fulmer. And that's it. So if you don't, then you close the door on it, and then JV's going to be here. You're going to have the same team. And in the grand scheme of things, the reason why attendance is down at Comerica, the reason why Fox Sports Detroit is losing viewership is the Tigers stink, and many people are over this roster. We're ready as a fan base to say, look, the window's closed, the blinds are shut, the era's over, thank you for the last 10 years, get me new guys that we can kind of look into and, and evaluate. It's roster fatigue at its finest, and many people are ready even to let go of a Michael Fulmer. And I know that on our poll question on our Twitter page, at Detroit Podcast, it came out 75-25, where the idea was 75% terrible. People didn't agree with it. But if a general manager calls and makes you a legitimate offer, you have to entertain it. And that's why a guy like Michael Fulmer and every single person not named Mikey Matuk is available for a trade. Not named Mikey Matuk? Yeah. Why, why, why not Mikey Matuk? Because I think if, if anybody called and said, I want Mikey Matuk, you would laugh at that general manager and think he was high when he called you. <laughs> that, guy, that guy is great, I guess, for what he is, but no one's going to trade for him. <laughs> Here's the deal. I, I just feel like you've got a piece, right, with Michael Fulmer, and you're going to have him under contract for – what, the next four or five years? So you're going to have him cheap. There's no reason to unload an asset in hopes to get two more assets or maybe three more assets if you're lucky. You already know what you have with this guy. This guy, it looks, and you can pencil him in to basically be your ace of your staff for the next four or five years that you have him under contract. You know what I mean? After that, you got to go to arbitration and you got to work on a new deal for him. But you've got the ace of your staff. This is essentially like... Getting Justin Verlander, you remember when Justin Verlander first came up? He was kind of brutal. He, he was real inconsistent. He was all over the place. This is like getting a much more complete, better version of Justin Verlander. So why are you going to sit there and unload a piece that you know what you have for something that you might have? This is the, the, the whole one in the hand, two in the bush. You know what I'm saying? You got Michael Fulmer. Why are you going to sit there and trade him away for the other two that are up there? It just, it just doesn't make sense to me. It, I don't feel like I, I feel like you're doing the team a disservice. You're doing your organization a disservice by trading a guy who is already an asset. What's the purpose of a trade when you make a trade with another team? You're sitting there in in, in the Tigers' case this season. You're trying to one unload salary and two. You're trying to improve your team for the future. Exactly for the future. Now, what would you define as the future? Two years from now, four years from now, five years from now? I'm saying that Michael Fulmer is going to be here. Let's say, for example, they don't trade him. He's going to be here for the next four years, and the team is not going to make the postseason more than once. Okay, so, so you don't think – I thought last week you said that this team could realistically be a contender in the next three years. That's if they made some moves that were legitimate and they actually were improved. Yes, you could, you could facilitate a move faster if you make solid moves. Of so course. wouldn't you want to have him, a, a guy who will sit there and possibly challenge for a Cy Young? He's already won a but rookie now, but of the year. He's an all-star in his second season. We, wouldn't we, you want that guy to be – but the, now, the, the focal point of two your weeks later, staff? we got additional information in terms of what some GMs are doing. So we said trade JV, trade Victor Martinez, mm -hmm. trade Miguel, but it's kind of starting to sprinkle out that those kind of trades might be incredibly super tough to do with you not taking a big, huge chunk. So it looks like what's going to happen. I would sit there and eat a chunk of all those contracts. That I, I had I'm to. starting to feel like by the trade deadline, JV might still be here, and the only pieces that you're going to probably trade are probably going to be Justin Wilson and J.D. Martinez, and that's it. And so because it's going to be super hard to put together a valuable deal. So with that more information coming to light, you say, okay, then who's next up that can get us jump-started in this rebuild, and that name is Michael Fulmer. I'm, like I said, I'm not advocating for it. I'm saying I'm willing to entertain it, and if the offer jumps off at you, all you need is two teams. If you get the Dodgers and Cubs to start bidding, and they're desperate, and they're like, okay, we're going to throw in – first, third, fifth prospect, and an everyday player, if you get that offer, 
I'm listening, and I might pull the pull, pull the trigger. The fans will be angry. They'll be pissed. But if you come out and you couch it properly and you say, look, this is a long-term rebuild. We have an opportunity now to restock the miners. Our goal now for the foreseeable future is salary cap relief, getting that in order, rebuilding the miners, and trying our best to get to the postseason and be consistent in the near future in three to four years. People would buy that. The anger would go away. I don't know. I just I feel like... You'd be hurting. You'd be setting your team back by trying to roll the dice. All right, let's move on, though. What are your thoughts on the Pistons? They're actually making some moves now. Uh, set their trade away Marcus Morris for Avery Bradley. Do you think that's going to help this team? Listen, I had thought that uh, the Pistons were going to make a huge mistake and sign KCP to a long-term deal. They did not do that. They renounced him. Not only did they not offer him anything significant, they said, look, we're going to not even restrict you. We don't think we're good you. enough at all. We're not going to restrict you. We're going to renounce you. And he ends up signing an $18 million deal with the Lakers. Good for him. Stan Van Gundy said it perfectly, and I can make it as succinct as possible. He said, look, our plan was to sign KCP, but once Avery Bradley was available, we had to go do it. And because of the moves that Boston made, it made a guy like Avery Bradley expendable, and you go out and you get him. He's just a better version of KCP, and that's what you have to do in sports, and that's why sports is a nasty business. You're, you're, you're rough riding it with your boys. You're trying to be a, comp- a contributing member of the team. But if, if the president and, and coach of the team finds a, a player better than you, he, he boots you out the door just like that. Avery Bradley's better than KCP. So I'm welcome him to the team, and I think he'll contribute. Do I think the Pistons are markedly better? A little bit. I do think that uh, with better defense, with a better three-point shooting team, and if they you know, have an influx of younger talent that can actually execute making threes, that's why you bring a Tolliver back. That's why you got a plethora of guards. Stan Van wants guys to make threes. So he's damn near going to have a team that shoots 50 of them per game. And let's see if they make them. And uh, because if they don't, if this is um, a team that stinks, I really do believe that there's an opportunity for the Pistons to blow this up and start over. So Bradley's going to be a free agent next year. So you let you, you trade Marcus Morris, you let KCP go, and there's a good possibility that you're not able to sign Bradley. So looking back on it would that trade then be a total bust would you have hurt this would you have hurt this team and this organization going forward if that's the case no because if you tie your your money to KCP for 5 years and 150 million now you're locked in you got to ride it out with them i really honestly believe that Stan Van realized okay this makeup maybe is not good i got to redo it again and get the guys that i really need to execute and that's what you always got to do you always got to look to improve the team and you can't you know, predict the future. Maybe Avery Bradley does a a wonderful job and he really, you know, really loves the city of Detroit and becomes a a contributing member of society and he loves it here. And maybe he'll sign a long-term deal. And with anything, winning cures all. So it's going to be really important to have a competitive team, maybe get into that first round, play Boston, take it to six, seven games. And maybe he'll be like, you know what? We're, We're one piece away. Why would I go somewhere else that's farther away? And so you never really know. It usually is about the money, but with all things being equal if the Pistons are competitive and they have a good season upcoming, which many people think they will with how nasty and bad the East is, I think winning and what they can offer might make it a lucrative situation with the Pistons. He's going to realize if the Pistons play better and it's a little bit more fun, playing for Stan fans, not all that bad. It can be fun, but it all comes down to winning. You got to win. Speaking of a team that's been quite quiet during the free agency period, you're Detroit Red Wings, and it appears that the NHL is no place for old men. That being said, <laughs> would you even sit there and, and, and inquire about signing a guy like a Yarmer Yager if you're the Detroit Red Wings? Isn't it shocking what his level of contribution has been in his mid-40s to the NHL? It's unbelievable. Dude, last year for Florida, he was their fourth best point getter. He had 46 points. He had 16 goals, 30 assists. I'm not sure where that puts him in comparison to the Red Wings. You know what's funny is that roster, it, but as yeah. you ask that question, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I wonder if Kenny Holland has a dartboard and he's got Tatar and Yarmer Yager and he's debating, <laughs> which guy should I, should I resign? You know, I had Tatar. He scored 25, 21, 29 goals for us. I got this Yager though. You know, he's, you know, experienced. He's a veteran and he's sitting there debating it and going, man, you know, I can. Uh, I don't have to pay Th- Thomas Tatar six million. I could pay Yager maybe two, three, and he'll come here and do the job. Maybe he's debating that, but should <laughs> that they would inquire- be funny if he was? Yeah, <laughs> he <laughs> might it surprise you if he was. No, that's no. that's why this is so ludicrous to think about that it came out of my mouth. But they might do it because of the salary cap. It's ludicrous how they're treating Thomas Tatar. Mm-hmm. But 
Yarmir Yager is an experienced veteran. You make a call, but do I think he's going to end up being on the Red Wings? No. Um, if he is, I expect him to get off to a hot start, score a couple goals in the first two games, and then he'll be out two or three weeks with a groin injury, with the flu, and, you know, nicks and bruises. He'll play 40 games. He'll get 20 points and probably get an extension. So he would be, <laughs> he would be third on your team with points if he was to join the Red Wings, no. and he would be uh, seventh. For goal scores. I think so. you need to repair right away the relationship you have with Mrazek and Tatar. Yes. Because those guys are pretty much, now we have a name, they're in the Calvin Johnson zone. They're ready to start. I mean, Tatar already started. He's like, look, if uh, I get to free agency, I'm going to test it out and I'm yeah. going to look. And Mrazek's like, he probably is still very butthurt that he was left unprotected. So they're pretty close. And it's not usual to hear Red Wings bitching, but it, it might start. Losing sucks. And when you start losing, people are going to start chirping. This entire team has been a complete disaster for <laughs> such a long time. No doubt about it. Hey, man, you did a great job. That's all I got for you today. I, I think that's enough. That was a bunch of questions. No so doubt about it. You did a good job. We'll take our final time out, regroup here, and to finish off this very fine podcast, we will talk about the week that was in professional wrestling in the Doc and Jock Pro Wrestling Report. Stay with us. You've been listening to all these fine podcasts on DetroitSportsPodcast.com. We greatly appreciate your support, and we appreciate those sponsors, supporters that have been with us early on in our project and those that are new signing up with us to support our network. All we ask is go check out Detroit sports podcast.com. It's where you can go click through the Amazon banner. You can buy tickets to all sporting events, listen to the daily podcast that we put out here and enjoy the entertaining quality that we put out daily. Check out Detroit sports podcast.com support those that support us click through the sponsor banners and we appreciate those that have been with us supporting us and that's what allows us to continue to do these podcasts each and every day not take vacations adding new sponsors adding new programs we got daily programming and we think we're one of the finer podcast networks in Detroit and all we ask is that you support us by visiting our website Detroit Sports Podcast.com. Yeah, boy, they put my boy over, AJ Styles. Dude's a superstar, and I didn't even think that you could elevate this guy to the heights that where he's at right now, but dude could even go higher. The pop that he got on SmackDown was unbelievable, but uh, what a great week this was for professional wrestling. Kind of a rejuvenating week in terms of having a great pay-per-view, having an okay so-so raw but having a spectacular SmackDown to end out the week. So it was a great week of wrestling. Um, did you catch the pay-per-view? Uh, I did not, but I did follow along on my phone. Okay. So I, I basically know what happened. And then after the pay-per-view, I went back and Dude, basically made, got all the info for, for what ended up transpiring. It made Extreme Rules look ridiculous in terms of the amount of violence. You had the Hardy Boys bleeding. A lot of blood. You had the Braun Strowman getting ran over by Roman Reigns. It was unbelievable. Samoa Joe was flinging Brock Lesnar around like he was no joke. It was all in all a great pay-per-view. I felt like it was unbelievable. There was really one moment that was quite ridiculous in that once Braun Strowman defeated Roman Reigns and they'd have that segment, all of a sudden they throw an impromptu match with Kurt Hawkins in there. You didn't even get to see it. And he's Slater. Yeah, they just throw it out there. And I say to myself, why do that? That's ridiculous. Nobody was paying attention to it. Just stick with it. You can have an extended vignette and let us see the aftermath, or you kick it back to the announcers and they're shocked at what they saw. You have an impromptu match, and it's kind of like, why would you embarrass Slater and Hawkins like that by wasting their time to go out there and, and, and then to cut away from it? So other than that, other than that little wrinkle, Great Balls of Fire, if you haven't seen it, five-star pay-per-view, great matches galore. You had, I thought the, the match of the pay-per-view was the Hardy Boys and Cesaro and Sheamus. They tore the house down, a lot of chemistry, a lot of back and forth, probably one of the feuds of the year in terms of going back and forth, all the singles matches, the way the programming has shaped up. And I know we're all invested in the Hardy Boys. We all want to geek out from the past, but that's why you bring in a team like the Hardy Boys. You bring them in, and I hate to say it, but they're enhancement talent. They're glorified superstars, but right now what they're doing is they're putting over Gallows and Anderson, putting over Sheamus and Cesaro. But because of that fact, because of the credibility that the Hardy Boys have, now Sheamus and Cesaro have a lot more credibility. Gallows and Anderson look a lot more credible when they go out there and destroy the Hardy Boys. 
That's what you do in the business. And now they're going to reap the rewards because they can lose a little bit for the foreseeable future and they can come back and unleash probably one of the greatest gimmicks of all time. And it's coming and it was awesome. But I respect what the Hardy Boys are doing. The pay-per-view was great all around. Maybe one thing I would have changed too, though, is I would have had Samoa Joe win the belt because he was so close. They literally brought you to the brink of excitement like he's going to do it. But all credit to Samoa Joe and all credit to the WWE because going into it, I didn't think that he – it looked like a squash. Like a, he – going into the feud with Brock Lesnar, I thought he looked like a jobber. But then as the vignettes happened, the promo started happening, the, the appearances that Samoa Joe made and the comments that he was making and the match that he had with Brock Lesnar – elevated him even further to the notion that he can actually carry the company and be the universal champion. I want to see it. I thought that he was impressive. I would have put the belt on him. I thought he earned it. Do you feel like that match was brushed? Because it was only like a six-minute match. It it was just kind of, let's go, let's go, let's go. I'm going to hit you with my move, and then that's it. And look, Lesnar Lesnar finished Joe off with one F5. And and that's a move that multiple superstars have kicked out of at different points. So it just kind of feels like... It just kind of was flat, and it doesn't feel like you can sit there and go anywhere. Like It feels like this is now a one-and-done program, and I really feel like this is something that you could have really stretched out. You could have got this thing to SummerSlam, and you probably could have got another match out of it. See, the way I look at it is two ways. We all want to elevate Samoa Joe. WWE wants to continue to elevate Brock Lesnar. Oh, I'm so tired of Lesnar, though. I'm not. I think that you can... The reason why... He's never Sum- there. But the reason why SummerSlam and WrestleManias and Survivor Series are heightened is you got to remember, too, we see these guys and we follow along in terms of all their dark matches, all their matches on television. So to have a guy that's not there all the time, each time he comes out, Brock Lesnar, I pop for it because you don't get to see him every time. So there is such a thing as a law of diminishing return. This is the thing I think they should do, and I think we've discussed this before. I think they need to put most of these guys on a revolving schedule where it's one week on, one week off of television. That way, when they do come out, you're not burnt out by them. Exactly. And so, like like I said, now a guy that I don't want to see anymore walking across the screen is, is Seth Rollins. Because you had him lose twice to Bray Wyatt. Such he, a horrible match. The character, not, but going into a feud with Miz is reinvigorating. That's awesome. That is awesome. So I look at it and I say to myself, okay. So you look at it, a guy like Seth Rollins is a character that I'm fatigued watching, but Samoa Joe, Brock Lesnar are characters I want to continue to see. I don't think it was rushed. I don't think a guy like Brock Lesnar is going to want to wrestle more than 10 minutes. He's got a great lush deal. He's into that Hulk Hogan stage where it's about the entrance. It's about the appearance. It's about putting people he's over. He's never done anything, though. Like, it, this is the problem. Like, with Lesnar, <laughs> he, he's never actually done any. Like, like Hogan sat there and, and carried a company through the 80s. Like, through the 80s. Like, legit. Like, a decade. He carried everybody. And then he sat there and he went to WCW and he carried WCW. What's Brock Lesnar ever done? Oh, he sat there and he tag teamed with Shelton Benjamin and that was about it, bro. Like I just, I feel like Lesnar gets a super cush deal just because. Like I just, I don't know, man. I, it bothers me because I feel like your world champion should be on TV at least twice a month, you know. And, and Lesnar's never around. They never stripped him of his belt. It, it took him almost four months before he sat there and was actually able to defend his belt, which was silly. I, I feel like certain guys have certain rules, and in it, it just, I don't know. It it really frustrates me because. He could sit there and he could start doing jobs for other guys and putting other guys over and elevating other talent, but everybody's got to sit there and they all got to lose to him. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's it, like you're you're not that good. Like your in-ring work is garbage. Honestly, you can't cut a promo. That's why you got Heyman with you and you never talk. And when you do talk, he kind of sounds like a prepubescent boy. I don't know if you've noticed or not. <laughs> Maybe it's all the steroids he takes. I'm not 100% sure. Maybe his balls are so shriveled up that they're basically inside of him now and now he's got a vagina. It's possible. I don't know. But it, it just, he doesn't, like, okay, to, to have the most complete package for a wrestler, you got to have good in-ring skills. You got to be able to cut a really good promo. And it would help if you looked physically imposing. He's got one of three. One of three. Now, a, a guy that most people hate and most people can't stand, a guy like, say, John Cena, right? He's got a, he's physically imposing. He cuts great promos. I don't care what you say about the man. The guy cuts phenomenal promos. His in-ring work needs to be better. Go to a guy like Roman Reigns. Physically imposing, awful on the mic, right? He's not not real good. Like he needs some help there. And his in-ring work, I don't care what anybody says, it's pretty solid, you know? Now let's go to a guy like Joe. Joe looks like he's going to legitimately kill you. Like he looks like he will cut your kidney out and then sell it on the black market. One of the best chants at the pay-per-view was Joe is going to kill you. So yes. it's great. It was great. Yeah. That goes back <laughs> to his TNA days. 
And then you sit there, you, you, you look at his mic skills. When they sat there and it was Roman Reigns, Brock Lesnar, and Samoa Joe all standing around in the ring on Monday night. Joe was the best. Joe brought you in and made you feel like it was so real. Like he legitimately hates Brock Lesnar. He hates Brock Lesnar more than me. And he's willing to sit there and slap the taste out of Roman Reigns' mouth, which everybody in that arena wanted. It, it just He is so awesome on the mic. He does such a great job. And his in-ring work, I know you don't like his punches, but his in-ring work is better than probably 75% of the guys on the roster right now. He's right that next should step. be yep. your guy who's your champion. He should be the guy who's carrying your belt and carrying your company. Now we go over to Raw, and two of the biggest storylines were the possible Shield reunion and the semi-broken Hardy Boys with that great promo. But it was so awesome. It I was, was geeking out in my seat. Everybody is excited about the potential gimmick of the Broken Hardy Boys and uh, Brother Nero and and Broken Matt Hardy. That's cool. It's going to be nice to see how they interpret it. The Shield reunion, I'm not really cool with, but if it facilitates a Miz-Seth Rollins type situation in a feud, I'll take it. But uh, I could avoid Dean Ambrose coming out and talking to the Miz. I mean, they're doing it each and every week. Well, and that, I'm, that's oh, I'm the over most it. tired bit there is. They got to stop it, it, right? It's absolutely brutal. And so that's what makes Raw a little bit stale a little bit. Um, I really like the fact that uh, Brock Lesnar is going to be at SummerSlam. He's coming out a little bit more in this summer months. But uh, I, I, he's I'm like kinda, a bear, and he's finally woke up from his hibernation. The two biggest things coming out of Raw was that uh, there's potentially going to be a surprise or a swerve regarding Kurt Angle and who texted Kurt Angle. Who texted Kurt? Is it going to be a potential former rival? you know, from TNA in the Impact days? Or is it going to be somebody, you know, from the authority? Is it going to be Vince McMahon? Is it going to be a female? Who's gonna, who, who was texting Kurt Angle? And what was he talking about when he said, I can't let this get out? So that was really cool. And then, the, like I said, the, uh, the promos that they had. I'm not really fond of potentially seeing Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar at SummerSlam. Nobody so, wants to see that. So I hope they do it again where it's Samoa Joe. It'll make it for a hot summer. What if what if, what if it was a fatal four way where uh, you sat there, you incorporated Braun, Braun Strowman, Strowman four? Roman Reigns, you like had that. Lesnar, and you had Joe. Eh, hey, they might do that, but I'm not a fan of four, let, let, fatal four ways. Let me. I'm not a huge fan of them either. But let me tell you why you do this, okay? Because it's obvious that Lesnar can't wrestle any more than seven eight minutes, <laughs> right. okay? So it saves him. Okay, so he can do his couple moves here and there, and he can just go hang out in a corner or just lay on the mat, whatever he's got to do. He could pull a Chris Jericho from WrestleMania where he just laid on the outside for what seemed like hours on end. You've got Roman Reigns, you got Braun Strowman, and you got Samoa Joe. All these guys can wrestle. They all got pretty solid in ring work. Uh, Joe can basically carry all the promos for all of these hacks, and it'll be outstanding. It'll be awesome. What ends up happening is. You ha- you can put it on Joe if you want. You could put it on Reigns. You could put it on you could put it on Strowman if you really wanted to. All right, you just can't let Lesnar win again. So it doesn't make Lesnar look weak if he loses to he, multiple guys. Yep. he can get pinned. Somebody else can he get pinned, pinned and yep. he can lose his belt, and it doesn't make him look weak. Yep. On top of it, anybody who loses in this match doesn't come out any worse for wear because you're going against three other guys. Yep, and whoever wins it gets elevated that much more because you're in there with. Four legitimate badasses, you know. There's the there's the four of you, and you're all bad mfers who nobody really wants to meet in a dark alley. So I think that would probably be the best case scenario. And you can get the belt off Lesnar, get it on Reigns if you want. You can get it on Joe if you want. You can even put it on Strowman, and I'm cool with that. I want to talk to you about the Kurt Angle thing. Two theories that that have been kind of going around the the internet, and I want to get your take on them. So he was talking on the phone. He told somebody he loved him. There's uh, all this this that and the other with this speculation of who it might be. You brought up Dixie Carter when I came into the studio today. You said, hey, do you think it could be Dixie Carter? I said, I like that idea. I think it's possible because he spent a ton of time in TNA, and he was really close with Dixie Carter. And where's Raw next week? Exactly. Nashville? Exactly. Her home. And she is now, she was on his 24, uh, was it 24-7 special or whatever it was on WWE Network. So they're doing some things with her now. And they're not afraid because TNA no longer exists. It's now Global Force Wrestling. They're not afraid to mention TNA. So I think that's a possibility. The other possibility that I like, and this sets up for what might take place at WrestleMania, is that's Stephanie on the phone. Yeah. Do you remember years yeah, ago yeah. when we had a Kurt Angle and we had a Stephanie love love Stuff, yeah. love triangle going on? Triple H totally killed the whole thing. Like he killed it in in the creative meetings. Like he was like, we're not doing that, and that's because that was his girl, and he didn't want to do it. So he totally crushed it. So this went on for, I think, like two, maybe three weeks. It didn't go on for very long. And it totally just kind of got pushed to the backside. And it just kind of went there and just kind of died. 
And now this is a way to bring up that old storyline. And what happens is Chad Gable is his illegitimate son. <laughs> so now you've got Gable or you got Jordan or you got J- Jordan and Gable. And now you've got Angle and you got your three Olympic champions, right? And you can sit there and he can be their mentor and he can start wrestling because he wants to wrestle again. Mm-hmm. This then sets up for Triple H to come into the picture. And that's what they've been speculating at WrestleMania. Triple H, Kurt Angle at WrestleMania. And you get that feud going because Triple H is now pissed off that Angle had a kid with Stephanie. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. You so, see how this works? Yeah, that's that's very it's super intriguing. convoluted, right? Super convoluted. <laughs> I think what they're probably going to do it might be Stephanie McMahon, but what would be more shocking if it was Dixie Carter? Oh, it'd so, be totally shocking if it was Dixie Carter. Yeah, it would bring some shock waves to see the former TNA because that's what, and I don't know if that's where they're at right now, but the more legitimate and more, you know, a version of that, it would be Stephanie McMahon. And that's how you launch the feud of uh, triple H versus Kurt Angle. If you want to get him back into the ring. So it's, it's one of those things where it was very cool to see. It is intriguing. It makes Monday again, a must see program, um, but they just got to deliver better. It's like, again, they're hampered by three hours and they're hampered by having to use the cruiserweights because it, it stinks. You have to do longer promos and you, while they, you know, tape up the ring and all that nonsense. And, uh, uh, you're, you're limiting time from the women who really, really, really need it. Yeah, I just, again, I don't understand why you don't separate those two entities. Put all the women on one brand, put all the cruiserweights on another, and let the cruiserweights be the pre-show for SmackDown. Because it, it'll give the people who get there early a show to watch. The Crow will be much more juiced and much more live. By the time you hit that third hour, man, like, honestly, I have to watch whatever happens that third hour, I got to watch it on DVR. Because I got to go to bed. I got to wake up at yeah, 5 in the morning. No doubt about it. And SmackDown was a great show. You had AJ Styles win the United States title at a house show, which you got to do from time to time because that's what it keeps people coming to say, wow, potentially speaking, a title could change hands, not on television. It's been about five years since it happened. So for a guy to go do it at Madison Square Garden, no better athlete than AJ Styles. It was great. It kicked off a great segment. I felt like introducing Kevin Owens made it a stupid segment. I felt like you had John Cena, you had AJ Styles, you could have teased that match. You maybe could have even had AJ Styles make a, a, a sick move and leave the ring or do something else if you didn't actually want to have the match. But to introduce Kevin Owens and Rusev, I get it if you want to set up the tag match at the end of the show. I told you, like, oh, okay, they're going to do a tag match, blah, yada, yada, yada. But I thought that the opening 10 minutes was awesome with the AJ Styles promo. Having John Cena come out and teasing that match was great. I wanted to see the payoff, or you could have did something different with the swerve with AJ Styles and doing something else. Or you could have just had um, Kevin Owens come out during that match and destroy AJ Styles and uh, do some things there to further it. But if that's how you want to do it, that was fine. I felt SmackDown was awesome. Great show all around. Great matches. Um, I felt like it was timed perfectly. I, I Like I said, SmackDown continues to roll along and continues to be the premier show, um, really taking advantage of the two hours, action galore, and it just hits you like, that's what a wrestling program really should be. Stretching it to three hours, I know you get more money out of it, it just makes for a tough watching experience, but SmackDown was unbelievable. To see AJ Styles and John Cena in the ring together tagging was pretty cool. Yeah, I thought SmackDown was a much better product this week than Raw was, Mm -hmm. and what's really weird about it is, for Raw, you've got all these different talking points that we could sit there and launch off of, but SmackDown was just, it, it was Succinct so much, yeah, to the point. It was so much stronger. And really, the only thing that we're kind of pulling out of it is this one match, this AJ Styles, John Cena, Kevin Owens, Rusev match, which was great. It was awesome. It, I, I like the whole setup. Yeah. I like AJ coming out, and then I like Cena coming out to, to take the challenge. And then I like Rusev coming out, or I like Kevin Owens coming out, and you knew Rusev was going to come out. So, like, you, you already knew what was going to happen. Yeah. And, and it was, I was, Totally fine with seeing it play out. And I I enjoyed the tag match. I thought it was solid. I do love Rusev. I think he's outstanding. I think he would be a better face than he would be a heel personally. But I, I, I SmackDown absolutely, is great. I Fashion loved it. Files, Shinsuke. Oh, dude, Fashion Sam- Files are so fun. Dude. <laughs> you got to watch to see that. I love them. How they're using Sami Zayn potentially with the new feud, you know, in the love triangle and all that kind of fun stuff with Maria and was it Mike? Mike, yeah. So it was, that was good to see. And uh, all around, it's a great show all around. And uh, I, I recommend it every single week. If you if you can only watch one show a week and you're going to devote two hours, I watched SmackDown over the Major League Baseball All-Star game, which ended up being a 2-1 basic snooze fest. Mm-hmm. So hit me up with the news and notes to get out of this podcast. Sure thing. So this is something I noticed watching both SmackDown and Raw. And this is something I noticed watching a lot more New Japan wrestling. New Japan likes to utilize a lot of singles competitors in tag matches. I mean, they'll have 
where they have like a 12 man tag match where you got six guys on one side and six guys on the other. Uh, most of the time it, it, it's an eight man tag where you've got four different guys sitting there standing around the ring and, you know, on each side sitting there wrestling. And I noticed that WWE, we just talked about the AJ Styles and John Cena versus Kevin Owens and Rusev match. They also sat there and did that with, uh, with the females with a tag match with Becky Lynch and, uh, and Charlotte versus Tamina and, uh, Natalia. So it seems like they're doing more of these singles competitors wrestling in tag matches. And I was wondering if you like that. Like, I, I think it's something great that New Japan does because what it does is it's an, it's an, the ability to sit there and infuse more talent on your program yeah. while not taking up more time. And it helps the wrestlers, too, because they're not the focus of attention. And you can extend their careers a little bit mm-hmm. by being in a tag match so that you know you can rest a little bit more. You're not going 20 minutes straight up. So I like the idea. I think they've been doing it quite a bit. I think that the amount of time that singles wrestlers perform in tag matches is appropriate. And they've been using it for quite a bit of time now. And it's good because... You know, then you could also do uh, the other way in reverse where you have like the Hardy Boys take on Sheamus and Cesaro. You know, you mix and match and have singles matches with some of those guys to highlight some of their skills. So I really think that uh, if there was going to be an area of improvement is the tag teams need like a sentinel moment. Like they're doing great skits. They're doing okay. But you don't have that like John Cena moment where he comes out and you're popping. Mm -hmm. They're there. They're a contributing force in SmackDown and on Monday Night Raw. But you don't have like a Legion of Doom or you don't have like a demolition where if a team comes out and you're like, I want to see them. Maybe now we're inching towards that with the broken gimmick with the Hardy Boys. But outside of that, I think you need a little bit of life with the tag team. So maybe you have a super team coming out. And, uh, you know, if you want to kind of break out a team, I would like to see Bo Dallas and um, Curtis Axel become a team and become a force. That'd on be Raw. Cool. Yeah, because then you can make them a force. You can make them must see and do. Uh, don't, make them jobbers. don't make them jobbers. Don't no, make them jobbers. Let them win. Make them must see on, on some level. Maybe giving them a hot female valet or something where a little bit more juice. And uh, they're doing okay. It's not bad. It's just something where it's just a little bit stale in terms of what they're doing with the tag division. But I think they're doing it, you know, in terms of how they're utilizing tag teams and tag team wrestling, just fine. And then earlier this week, TMZ got some uh, got a hold of some audio. And look, the whole thing with Paige and Alberto Del Rio looks super rocky at this point. Yeah. And that relationship seems to get scarier and scarier by the moment. This audio took place at an airport. Del Rio was flying to uh, to an indie show. Um, apparently, him and Paige got into an He's altercation. He's still the GPW now, Unified GFW, Champion. GFW, oh, yeah. yeah. Yep. And I don't know how much longer that's going to last because no. honestly at the end of each uh, at, the, at the end of each taping he gets on the mic and basically sits there and he badmouths WWE. Recently oh, G- is he? yeah. Uh. Recently uh, GFW turned up the turned up his uh music when he started to do it. He grabbed the mic and he was like this is the time of night where I sit there and I bash that uh, company out there in Stanford. And then he started to go into it and then what happens is the guys in the back cranked his music so loud and cut his mic. He then tried to scream over his music which didn't really work, and then finally he gave up and went to the back. So he's 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 a total loose cannon right now. Like I don't know if he's on on drugs. I don't know if he's got. An, I'm assuming he's got an alcohol problem. If you've seen any of his uh, Periscope or YouTube yeah. videos, I mean he's off the chain with a lot of the stuff he says. But going back to this page situation, so they're in the airport and Del Rio's trying to travel from one place to another, and they end up getting into an altercation. Page the following day comes out and basically tries to cover all this up by saying. Hey, some lady wanted a photo, and then somebody threw a drink, and you know we got to get the cops involved. It's no big deal, no big deal. At this point, she's starting to sound like she's the, the I fell into the table yeah. chick. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So this audio comes out, and on the audio, you can hear her crying. You can screaming, hear screaming. Yes. yes, you can hear her and Del Rio going back and forth, back and forth. And Del Rio says something to her. It's kind of muffled. She's crying. She says. Go ahead, call the cops. It'll get me the fuck away from you. I've been yeah. trying to get the fuck away from you forever. I need to get away from you. And she's just in tears and she lost it. And then you can hear some fan come up and she's walking next to him and she's taping it. And at this point, Del Rio now realizes that he's being filmed. So his tune kind of changes. And the lady's like, you shouldn't go out. You should go after her. You shouldn't go after her. Something like that. And what ends up happening is she's like, I'm a huge fan, which was totally Weird. stupid. Yeah. But it puts Del Rio in a real bad light right now. It seems like this is a very abusive, controlling relationship. Paige needs to get out. Her brothers come out and spoke out on social media about it, saying that Del Rio is extremely controlling and that he doesn't sit there and allow her the freedoms that she should have. And it, it just seems like 
there's a lot of smoke. And when there's a lot of smoke, yeah. there's usually fire. It's a toxic relationship, and the way you look at it, it's two dramatic people. Alberto Del Rio is dramatic, and Paige is dramatic, and two people like that can't be in a relationship because no matter what, the way they resolve their problems is through anger, is through fighting and yelling. And when you can't control yourself to not fight in public, I mean, damn, your guys are professional wrestlers. You represent companies, and these are not uh, companies that are like low end. These are companies now that are trying to invest millions in you that could give you endorsements and promote you and let you build on your restaurants and all that kind of stuff. So if they can't get over it, it's a toxic relationship, but it just also seems like Paige is putting herself in a lot of situations where there's drama involved, and you just tell yourself, look, she's got to grow up. She's got to get herself right. She's got to maybe take some time to herself and work on these things, but it's a shame because you got talented individuals and you're making a fool of yourself. It's just not a good look for either of them, and it's embarrassing, and you just hope that if it's an abusive situation, she gets out of it quickly, but do you have friends that get into these off and on relationships that never end and you're like hearing both sides all the time and you're like, oh my God, Mike's texting again. He's telling me about Sam and she's uh, horrible. And you got Sam texting you and he's, she's like, Mike did this and Mike did that. And you're just like, I should just drop both these people. Right, right. Um, not so much now, but I did. That's and crazy, right? Yeah, it, it's it just, you just look at me and you're like, what are you doing? Yeah. Like, Why? Yeah, it's, like, it's a totally toxic. Who wants relationship? all that drama in your life? Get the hell out! Get the hell out! Yeah. and then you, and then you always end up fearing, like you know, giving the standard advice is going to make you look bad when they get mm-hmm. back together, and you ripped on both of them. Yep. you know, you're like, oh shoot, maybe I shouldn't have said that about that person, or maybe I shouldn't have said that about Mike. I'm like, oh man. So the best advice you give is uh, when your friends bitch about their significant other, just be like, sorry, bro, support you. Good luck with that. <laughs> That's all you got to say is good luck with that, and uh, that'll get you out of some trouble. But yeah, it's it's, it's a bad look. It's one of those looks where you hate to see it, but it's one of those situations where sometimes you do fear like a person like Paige might end up, you know, dying very young because of addiction problems or getting into abusive type stuff or being at the wrong place at the wrong time. Dramatic stuff it usually ends up pretty bad. So you hope for you hope for the better, but you would hope that she focuses her attention on getting back in the ring. That's yeah. where her love is. That's where she makes her name. That's where that's where she should be. Like at this point, I'm really surprised WWE hasn't cut all ties with her because the things that Del Rio says just about the company, about Triple H, about Vince, it's it, it just about everything. It, it's just really uncalled for. And then at the time, at times, she's super embarrassed. And, like, she's trying to cover his mouth, like, don't say this, don't talk like that. I mean, that's still her employer. Yeah. And I, I, maybe the only reason she's not getting let go is because she is out on injury or perhaps it's because The Rock is doing that that film with her or about her and her family. I don't know. It's just it's really surprising that this has continued to go on. And I think it's even more surprising that she still puts herself in this situation or she's involved in this relationship. I mean, at some point, you just got to do what's best for you. You got to get out. You know, you can't keep going back and going for more and more and more and just, again, keep falling into the table, falling into the doorknob. You know, and there have been times where she has bruises on her body and, and people have questioned her about it. And, and she comes up with lame excuses all the time. So starting to put two and two together here, coming up with four, Del Rio. Much like Money Mayweather, total POS. Just saying. You like how I correlated the whole the whole program, bro. I that wrapped it up in a nutshell. You see that, that? was good. I'm good getting stuff. good at this stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> Great podcast. Enjoyed the time. Thanks for everybody finding us across the various podcast platforms. Continue to support us and the other shows by visiting DetroitSportsPodcast.com, subscribing on iTunes, leaving great reviews, getting more and more of those. We greatly appreciate the five-star reviews. For the jock, Adam Strozinski, I am the doc. John Macaroon, see everybody next week. We look forward to it. Please, Al Avila, don't screw up the trade deadline. Please don't screw up the trade deadline. This was locker room talk. Second dick. Sorry, Detroit. <laughs> Didn't quite work out. And I, all I can say is Detroit Sports Podcast stars. I have voices in my head. They counsel me. They understand. They talk to me.